If you've ever used the infotainment system in a recent Volvo or Polestar, you'll already be somewhat familiar with the chip that's running GTA 5 here in this laptop. Let me explain. For quite a while now, Intel has had not one, but two main lines of CPU architectures. On the one hand, their high-performance core architecture for laptops, desktops and servers, see Sandy Bridge, Skylake, Haswell. But on the other hand, they've also had their low-power, efficient Atom line of CPUs for embedded purposes, but also tablets and even smartphones. And these two lines of CPUs have existed parallel to each other, each receiving architectural and process node improvements over time. And now with the new Alder Lake chips, we finally see the inclusion of both architectures in a single package. And what's running GTA 5 here is a Goldmont Celeron N3450, a 6 watt quad core without hyperthreading, base frequency of 1.1 GHz with a boost up, up to 2.2 GHz. The Goldmont architecture was used in a ton of chips, the majority being the Denverton atoms, which were usually integrated into networking and storage devices. Now the odd thing about the Atom architectures of this era is that compared to the high performance core architectures, where you usually have few high performance cores with hyperthreading, with Goldbond you have a lot of low power cores without hyperthreading, with fascinating parts like a 31 watt 16 core CPU, which I would love to test. Besides Denverton, then there was also Apollo Lake, small 2-4 core chips for tablets and, like with this Acer laptop, undesirable notebooks. But more importantly, four models specifically for embedded automotive purposes. In 2018, Intel announced that Volvo's new Android-based infotainment system would be powered by an Intel Atom chip. And a year later, with the launch of the electric Polestar 2, they specified this to be one of the Goldmont A3900 chips. And looking at the A3900 lineup, we can see that they are all very similar to the notebook Apollo Lake chips, with the A3940 being nearly identical to this Celeron N3450 we have here. And personally, I've been fortunate enough to have gotten a lot of hands-on time with Volvo's infotainment, back then not knowing what powered it, and while the UI was great, it wasn't exactly very snappy. But how fast is Volvo's infotainment? And could you play Crisis on it? Well, let's find out. As for the system specifications, we have an Acer Aspire ES17 with 8GB of DDR3-1600 running Windows 10 on a 1TB hard drive. And this was a budget laptop in 2017, costing around 400 euros, and overall it's okay, but it's mostly let down by the horrible viewing angles of the display. But back to benchmarks. In the mostly single-threaded web tests, the Celeron N3450 turned out to be on the level of Intel's Sandy Bridge, scoring nearly the same as the 1.9GHz Celeron G465, apart from in Cinebench, where it was a lot slower. In multi-thread I was expecting decent performance as it has four true cores, and in some benchmarks like 7-zip and CPU-Z, it was able to get relatively close to the Sandy Bridge i5-2520M, a 35 watt dual core with hyperthreading. But it's safe to say overall it's not exactly rapid. When looking at some real-world performance, it's just about able to play AV1 720p 60fps YouTube stream, but that's really at the upper limit of its capabilities, also due to a lack of GPU hardware decoding. Next up I wanted to have a look at the operating characteristics, here using POV Ray, a multi-threaded workload, and here we can see two things. That one, it sticks nicely to the 6 watt rating, always staying around 5.8 watts or so, and also despite having a base frequency of 1.1 and a boost of 2.2, even in a heavy multi-threaded workload, it still always runs at around 2.1 GHz, so that's pretty nice to see. Next up, I also wanted to have a look at the efficiency, and here for I'm comparing it to the i3-1115 G4 I tested a while back against the Pentium M, because at the moment Tiger Lake is still Intel's latest and greatest for laptops, 
and it's made on their 10 nanometer super thin process. And here when we compare it in the POV ray benchmark, we can see that the i3 is much faster as it we've seen in the benchmark, the score is also much higher. But here we can also see that it uses, uh, that it has a much higher power draw, sticking uh, after the initial turbo boost to around 19 watts, whereas the Celeron is around 6, but also takes well over 10 minutes to complete the benchmark. And knowing how long they took and their average power draw, we can calculate their efficiency. And here we can see that despite having a much older process node, 40 nanometer for the Celeron N3450, it still consumed 34% less energy to complete the entire benchmark render. So that is kind of fascinating to see that, yeah, these chips are really efficient. So that's fine and all, but can it run Crisis? And the answer is yes, yes, it can run Crisis. Here we are in Crisis 2, running at 800 by 600 at around 15 to 19 FPS. On the lowest settings, of course, which is still called very high in Crisis. And also using DX9. And even though the FPS is low, it is at least relatively consistent, so it's enough to play it somewhat. Something interesting I noticed during my testing though is that at the start of the run, you can see the SOC power spike way above 6 watts. And some investigation revealed that actually the GPU is too powerful for its own good. Even though it's the lowest end of the Skylake i GPUs with just 16 EUs and a max frequency of 700 megahertz, we can see that it managed to gobble up more than the entire max package power limit. Here you can see the total system on a chip power and the total GPU power in light blue. And here at the start of the run it manages to use 7 watts. And after that the uh, power management totally freaks out and heavily throttles both back to a stable 6 watts. And if we continue and overlay the frequencies, we can see also that the CPU takes a big hit in its uh, operating frequency going from 2100 down to between 17 and 1800. And the GPU goes from its boost of 700 down to around 450 to 500 megahertz. So that's pretty interesting to see. And just because HD500 actually supports Vulkan, here we have Doom 2016 running at 1280 x 720 with 50% resolution scaling. So actually only 360p. And of the three games tested, this ran the best at around 17 to 21 FPS. And apart from the colorful artifacts on the edge of the display, not sure what's going on there. What we can also see here is that the CPU is throttled back even further here in Doom, maintaining only around 895 megahertz on all four cores. And if we look at the power consumption here, we can again see a big spike to 9 watt at the start, caused entirely by the GPU power, which then throttles back, maintaining 6 watts. And here we can see with the frequency overlay that the CPU, that the CPU starts at 2100, and then goes back to between 900 and 1 gigahertz. The GPU does a bit better here, spikes to 700 and then maintains 600 megahertz throughout the run. And finally, as I showed at the start of this video, we have a GTA 5 running at 800 by 600 on DirectX 10, even though Afterburner says it's DirectX 11, with the lowest possible settings and it averages around 11 to 15 FPS. It's not very playable, unfortunately. <laughs> So what's the performance of Volvo's infotainment system like? Well, unfortunately, Intel didn't specify the exact model of Atom Automotive Volvo used. But if Ars Technica's article is to be believed, it has at least an HD 500i GPU, the same as the N3450. So we're either looking at the dual-core A3930 or the quad-core A3940. Either way, I think from the benchmarks we've seen, it's broadly clear the kind of performance level we're dealing with. And it certainly won't be able to compete with Tesla's RDNA 2 APUs going into their latest models. But in any case, it's been fun to find out if you could run Crisis on Volvo's infotainment. And I'd say, yeah, you could. And on that note, I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you did, a like would be very much appreciated. And if you want to be kept up to date on future projects, why not consider subscribing to the Fully Buffered channel? That was all for now and bye bye.